This time on One Foot Flipper, we look at the seven deadly sins of reselling. Stay tuned. One Foot Flipper. All right, Paige here, the One Foot Flipper. How's it going, everybody? Going okay for me. Sales are bad, but it's also... Also, still don't have a lot of good items listed yet. Only just started walking on that new prosthetic leg. Just gotten out a few sourcing opportunities. Haven't really had an opportunity to list many of those items I sourced yet because, of course, it's spring break. Spring break means daughter Julie is home. And daughter Julie being home means I do less, get less real work done. Also doesn't help that it's the time of year where the ground where my basement is absolutely freezing and that's where all the real work is done but the rest of the house is warm so I don't want to go down there once the ground temperature warms up a little bit I will get a lot more work done so today today's video topic is seven deadly sins of reselling this was a request from my friend Jay Ride Jay Ride flips thanks for barking Parker and so let's just get into it we'll start at number seven and work our way down uh, number seven, purchasing issues. Now, this can be purchasing items that don't sell. You know, you heard that comics and sports cards are hot, so you go out and you buy a whole bunch of them. Then you discover the brutal truth that most sports cards are worthless, and most comics from the past 40 years also, while not as worthless as the sports cards, they might as well be. They are not sellable as single issues, and you've got to bulk them up, and the the few that are actually worth any individual amount of money are very few and very far between. Perhaps you're paying too much for the items that do sell. You, you really don't want to be selling things on a $1 to $2 margin unless those things were free. And even then, you've got to be incredibly fast at processing them. Uh, and if the market slips downward even slightly on a, on a low margin type of category you've got then you're losing money on every sale and you really want to be doing that and there's the big problem purchasing way more than you list your sell is your house full do you have a storage container is that full is it shed full is that extra car that you never got rid of because you couldn't sell it because it's full of death pile is that full you're about to run a third storage unit because the first two are full and yet you're still outsourcing every weekend that is a problem right there or in purchasing issues could just be purchasing perfectly decent items but they're the wrong items for you I hate glass my storage area is not set up for glass I don't have a bunch of open shelves I have bins and banker boxes on shelves horrible for glass I don't even stock the best packing materials for glass I really feel like most glass items are a mistake for me even if I get them for free I was just given six oil lamps for free and I kind of wish that I hadn't been given given them now I have to deal with that when if I had just never gotten them I would have felt like I'd been perfectly happy uh, for you it might be that box of Warhammer miniatures you found you don't know anything about them by the time you put on all the research in them you're gonna end up making 12 cents an hour really why not just send those gaming miniatures to me i'll pay you for them take a small profit let me worry about ringing every last cent out of them because i'm not gonna have to do 100 hours of research to do it you hate records pass the amazing deal on to a record seller like i know i don't want to sell clothes at all if i find a clothing deal i'm gonna pass that on because i don't want it sometimes you can be better at just purchasing the things that you are best at selling and best at uh working their way through your system than taking things out of your niche that's going to quadruple the amount of time it's not going to store great with your other items just leave that stuff alone all right moving down the list number six shipping issues now i personally think the biggest shipping issue out there is just lighting money on fire during your shipping process whether it's one way or another Maybe you're forcing your customers to pay for pointless shipping upgrades. You know, you're forcing priority mail on light items. You're forcing package shipping on standard envelope items. You know, $5 trading card, you're making the people pay for you to send that in a box. You know, all that does in the end, it just devalues your item. The person is just going to pay less for the item. They don't want to pay. No one wants that upgraded shipping. Or 
sorry, very few people want that upgraded shipping. I used to offer multiple levels of shipping on my trading cards, and every time somebody picked an upgraded level, I asked them if it was an accident. And every t single time, they said, yes, it was an accident. Could you please ship the cheaper way? Very, very few people want to pay more for shipping. It's the, the, the ones who do are unicorns. Are you shipping things at the counter at the post office? Now, I know you say, Paige, come on. It's 2024. I'm not doing anything like that. I know this seems like a ridiculous thing to even ask most of you. But here's the thing. People with thousands of feedback who have been selling since the 1990s show up on the eBay forums every single day and let slip that they do this. I get retail packages, retail post packages from eBay sellers for things I purchase all the time. And many of these sellers are indeed not brand new to the game. Hey, are you buying boxes at Walmart? And then still shipping priority, not even using the free priority boxes? Why are you doing that? Are you even comparing multiple shipping services when you're shipping? If you're not, why not? At the very basic, most not even thinking about it level, you can at least do it within the eBay shipping system. If not, jumping over to Pirate Ship to double check it there as well. There's a little bit of an art to that. You can kind of figure out when you should check Pirate Ship and when you don't. I don't want to try to instruct you on how because as rates change, so will when you should check and when you shouldn't check. But you're, you're going to want to be checking all the time. Uh, let's say that package comes up an ounce heavy, puts it over an ounce into the next pound. Are you trying to shave weight anywhere and reweigh the item and get it down to the next pound class? I know I do that. Are you needlessly overpacking things that don't require it and causing that package to bump up to the next pound or the next next size class? Quite a lot of a lot of people do this. I over my eBay career have continued to reduce how much packaging I I am using, particularly on items that are hard to damage. Like if I had an item like some train tracks in a brand new retail box. Three years ago, I probably would have put that train track box in another box, even if that, in another box with packing material, even if it bumped it up an entire weight class and I had to pay for the box. And now I will put that retail box into a poly bag and ship it out. Particularly if it's not a vintage item. If it's a vintage item, the condition of the box may matter. But if it's just a run-of-the-mill normal retail item, do the same thing Amazon does. Put the plastic bag over it, slap the label on it, get it out of there. Let's just say that you're pretty good. and You only overpay for shipping by $2, maybe 10% of the time. And you are a 20 item a day seller. So even that just 10% flub up rate there means you're lighting $1,500 a year on fire. Do you know how many fugglers you could buy with that? Do you know how many bags of beaver nuggets you can get from Bucky's for that much money? I don't. The only Bucky's in Missouri is several hundred miles away from me. So if you do know how many bags of beaver nuggets you can buy for $1,500, please do put that below in the comments. Also, what do beaver nuggets taste like? I have no idea, but I'd really like some. All right, your number five in the seven deadly sins is thinking that your item is better because you touched it. Or that otherwise, that you can somehow, some way, sell your item for significantly more than identical items on the web, on the same website. I mean, obviously yours is better than the others. It has to be. You have it. You only pick good stuff. You only pick the best stuff. Your customers know that they can get a premium DVD buying experience by getting a used copy of Quigley Down Under for you for $5 more than the brand than the price of a brand new sealed one for your competition. They know this. Although really, the real fact is that with very few exceptions, your customers have no idea who you are. You are no one to them. They are buying from eBay or Mercari or Amazon. They're not buying from you. Although in all your claims in your listings of quality or experience, there mean nothing in a listing that's halfway down the second page when sorted by its lowest price 
or even sorted by best match because guess what best match best match still takes price into account if m market price of the item is twenty dollars and you're you're at 47 you're not showing up in best match either sorry bud doesn't work that way really there's almost nothing repeatable you can do that to make your identical item sell for more money than your competitors you could come up with a completely different title that won't bring up the competition and that might work for a one-off item if you've got more than one of them though it'll only work for a little while the competition will notice and they will do the same thing to their item renaming theirs to compete with yours I mean, promoted listings will sometimes get you a lightning strike sale at well over market, but you can't count on it. You know, every once in a while, if you go search something, you'll see, hey, quickly down under, sold for $4, sold for $5, sold for $4, sold for $3.89, sold for $6.10. Whoa, this one sold for 15 U.S. How the hell did that happen? I have no idea, but that's a lightning strike. You cannot model your business around lightning strikes. There's only one consistent way to get people to overpay for your items, and that is to get them browsing your store all on its own and not comparing your items with those of other people. And good luck doing that. If you find a way to actually get people to do that on a regular basis, let me know. Hey, number four of the seven reselling sins is not knowing the basics of selling on the venue you're using. This can run the gamut from just not knowing how to write a basic title or listing. You'd think that everybody would know how to do this, but I can't tell you the number of listings that I see on a daily basis from people with thousands of feedback who fail to even identify the item they are selling in the title. Used red shirt. I see shirts without the word shirt in the title. Uh, and then items can get even worse. They will manage to not name the manufacturer, even though the manufacturer is on the item. Just awful. Your, your title should identify the item as best as you can. And also just the rules of the website. Like, for example, 50 people a day who have been selling on eBay for many years show up in the eBay forums not understanding simple basic things like eBay fees, disputes, or returns. Educate yourself on how to make listings in your show chosen field and and the rules of the website that you are using all right got number three not understanding your own business this can be not understanding your true profits or loss not understanding your sell-through rate or continuing to buy items that are worth your time yeah we lose 24 dollars on every unit but we make it up in volume this is going to most classically show up in two basic ways the first is not understanding the full level of your overhead. You know, your overhead is the stuff beyond just the cost of the item. You know, this Dr. Pepper cost me 50 cents. It's the other expenses. The expense of the computer, I listed this Dr. Pepper can on it. The cell phone bills, all of that stuff. Supplies. Basically, if you're on eBay or similar fees are often about 13 percent and people think that that's their entire overhead cost they are not thinking about anything else they're spending money on i spent six thousand five hundred dollars on supplies tools and miscellaneous last year that's not shipping or anything else that's just physical items and i think i might have had a subscription in there for a month to use a software tool and on a hundred thousand a year on sales that increases my overhead from 13% suddenly to 20%. So my overhead's not 13%, it's 20. So I shouldn't be trying to sell things and only have a 20% margin after cost of goods. And in my you know basic notepad calculations there, I didn't even include things like promoted listing fees, any sort of customer refunds, uh, or anything like that. Probably safer to use a 25% or even one third, you know, 33% is a safer total overhead cost when figuring things out. Which means that you probably, for the most part, shouldn't be buying something for $66 to sell for $100. Not unless you are really, really know your numbers and are really more invested in the numbers of your business to understand it. Now, you can indeed dive deeper into those overhead costs and do just that. You could figure out which ones are fixed for your business, regardless of how much business you do. You know, I'm going to be paying for the same internet bill, phone bill. I'm going to be replacing my computer and my 
other tools on the same basic <laughs> replacement level, whether I sell $10,000 a year or $1 million a year. Those, cost, those basic costs are going to be fixed, but other costs are going to ramp up as I sell more. My consumable supplies, you know, every, every order I send out is going to use a thermal label. I'm going to burn up a thermal, thermal printer for every 6 million labels, or who, who knows what it is, but, you know, I'm going to use a certain amount of boxes or poly bags that I paid for for every however many orders. If I'm using promoted listings, I'm going to have advertising expenses that will ramp up. There's a lot of supply things that ramp up. And if you want to delve deep, you can figure that out to figure out exactly what you can truly be doing and not doing. Or just use one of the safe numbers of 25 or 33 percent, one third or one fourth, because that'll work for most people. Uh, your second way is of not understanding your business is not understanding the amount of time that goes into each sale. This is where your hard to package items, low dollar breakables, things like your trading cards, your postcards, and your stamps that you might love are going to start breaking your heart. On these low dollar items, you need to time yourself every step of the way from listing the item to filing it away to pulling it and packing it. And if something like trading cards, postcards, or stamps, or anything else with a ridiculously bad sell-through rate, then you need to time yourself listing and filing five of them, and then pulling and shipping one of them to get your true time to process these items. And that is when you want to go lay down and take a nap and cry, because you're going to find out you're probably not even making $5 an hour on that stuff, and that's not including your sourcing time. No need to take this to an, as an insult, card sellers, postcard sellers, or any of you. I do encourage you to time your processes. And if I'm wrong for your business, then I'm wrong for your business. And I'm glad that I'm wrong for your business. But if I was right and you take my advice to heart, I'm even happier. Actually, I'm happy either way as long as you're happy. Okay, number two down the list of seven deadly sins of reselling is using the wrong venue or the wrong selling format for the item. You don't want to try to part out that 1986 Ford Escort on whatnot. If you even get one per, you're going to sell the entire car for a dollar. Because nobody is sitting on whatnot wanting to buy a hood to a 1986 Ford Escort. It's not happening. You need to put that on eBay, or you need to put that on one of those auto park junkyard type websites. I don't know the names of any of them, but I've seen them out there. Whatnot or Poshmark wrong format for auto parts. You don't want to sell low dollar single trading cards on websites that don't have cheap shipping. If it doesn't have some sort of standard envelope shipping or allow untracked stamp shipping, you don't want to be selling those items on that website. You don't need to be spending four dollars to ship something that you could be shipping for 60 cents. Uh, next, you don't want to use seven day auction format on anything that isn't both high demand and hard to price. Honestly, I won't use seven day auction format on anything at all at this point, I don't think. Somehow I go entire years without encountering anything that I think that that would be a better format on. And I know that's gonna insult some of you who still do auctions. Hey, you don't have to listen to me. You can do whatever you want. I'm not in charge of you, but I personally wouldn't seven day auction anything. And if you look at what is on eBay or any place else with the seven day auction, 98% of the stuff that's listed for auction is also other people have it for buy it now, and usually they have it for cheaper than the opening bid on the auction, and that's why auctions don't sell. And finally, you don't like you don't want to go in trying to sell things on Facebook Marketplace thinking that anybody is gonna buy anything on Facebook Marketplace. I've had customer I've had so many customers just vanish off the face of the earth after they left their house to pick up things for me on Facebook Marketplace that I'm pretty sure there must be some sort of black hole down at the end of my street. Now I'm sure some of you somehow have had some success there. I just don't understand how. And finally, our last one, most important seven deadly sin, the one most commonly done is price guessing. Do you know how the vast majority of sellers on eBay and other websites price their items? Well, yeah, page. They look up the solds and they look up look up the currently listed, then they look up historic solds and historic they research historical sales prices, and then they come. To, no, they just guess. They guess or they arbitrarily name a price and they do zero research. 
and you've got both the personal price guessers they're just selling for themselves and you have the big business price guessers and what they do is they import their entire website or storefront into ebay usually with the exact same prices they have on their own website or in their own store not caring what the ebay market is for those items even though 80 90 percent of it will never sell at the prices that they put it in at they don't care a big example of that in my own specialty is noble night games they are probably the premier tabletop gaming website on the internet because they have everything from brand new stuff to stuff back from the 70s however they also seem to mirror their entire store on ebay which has over a quarter of a million items and their ebay sell-through rate is over four years because only a tiny percentage of their items are ever competitive on ebay at any given time now in this case there's a very high chance that they just don't care that eBay is just a bonus to them. It's not where most of their sales come from and that they would rather just get that eBay sale and are not gonna cut into it any further than that 13% commission they're already paying eBay. And that's the case for them. That's what works for them. However, bet if it was your personal store or your own smaller business, you might indeed care to bother to try to be competitive on a website that you're listing on. And here's what happens when you price guess. One of two things happen. You either guess low and the item sells quickly, or you guess high and the item never sells unless the market price for the item changes over time. Now, there are extremely large sellers out there who price guess every single item they sell. They don't even think they're doing anything wrong because store with many thousands of items, they're constantly gonna have a small percentage of appropriately priced or even nicely priced items because market prices are gonna fluctuate over time. Thus, they're getting sales. Thus, they think they're doing things right when they're not. All right, so if you've been price guessing, how should you recover from that? If you've got a small store, only a few hundred items, just start price researching and reprice every single item. Don't list another item until you're done. Now, if it's gotten out of control, you have a 7,000 item store, a 37,000 item store, go ahead, go into your store, Rename all your store categories. To add the word clearance to each category. Book clearance, plates clearance, whatever. Duck clearance, doesn't matter. Add the word clearance to each category and then recreate the categories without the word clearance as well. So your new items will go into the, the non-clearance categories and all your old stuff's in the clearance categories. Then mark everything in the clearance categories down 10%. Then every month, mark it down 10% again. And just keep doing that until there's nothing left in the clearance categories where there's enough left for you to actually pre price research all those items. And believe me, it can take a long time, depending on how bad your price guessing was, to actually get the items down to market prices. If you are off by a factor of 10, it'll take uh, 22 months for you to even get that item down to uh, appropriate market price. And I see many things on eBay for sale every single day that are off by far more than a factor of 10 in the price. But to keep up at it, eventually you should be able to sell it all with markdowns or get the item low enough to manually research them all. Hey, I think I've blabbed enough for today. If you know anybody who's guilty of any of these things, or if you're guilty yourself, why don't you hit that subscribe button or tell the people about it so they can hit the subscribe button. And make sure you're still subscribed. Hey, it's been great. Hope to see you again soon. Bye.